I've been looking at your work and yeah, you're amazing. And I, I know you followed me for a while, but unfortunately I have not followed you. Uh, and now I am. And uh, it was Stephanie Dodier, by the way. Oh. AES uh, person. And I'm like, okay, yeah. I need Thank to you. I'll reach out to her too. That's an awesome uh, endorsement. Yes. Yeah, so she was very complimentary about you. And she was the one that brought it to my attention about uh, fat discrimination actually starting as a racial thing. And I'm going, wait, what? Like, I was shocked when she told me, she's like, here is the expert you need to talk <laughs> about, besides the author of that book. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited to get into that here today. Oh, excellent. Me too. I always love talking about it. Excellent. And I'm friendly territory. I, I like to I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I some know. People, the hot topic. I don't understand that, but it is what it is. All right, well, let's get this show on the road. And like I said, very conversational. Don't feel like I'm interviewing you, just chatting okay. with a friend. Uh, it's oh, a excellent. nice feel and people feel comfortable hearing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know my work, so you mm -hmm. know I, that's, my, mm -hmm. that's my jam, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> How are the chickens? What's that? How are the chickens? Oh, they're doing great. They're still pooping out breakfast for me, so uh, <laughs> I love it. I'm down to 19. Legally, I'm only allowed to have six, oh, but I've wow. had as many as 30. Wow. Nobody ever calls anybody. And, I remember oh. when you got them. What's that? I remember when you first got them. Yes. Well, when we first got them, we had four roosters of the six we brought home, and we we're not allowed to have roosters. And so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, that, I should have, like, I did take a little bit of video of us, like, trying to throw sheets on top of them to catch them to corral them oh it's hilarious <laughs> three hours to catch four roosters oh my goodness box them back up again but yes it's uh back in the periscope days remember i used yes. to do periscope. yes uh oh i'm dating myself yes. Now also <laughs> yes all right well let's get this show on the road i know you're a busy woman and i've got jimmy ranch to do in about an hour a uh, couple hours so <laughs> let's get the show on the road all right, so I'm just going to go right into it. <clears throat> Shelby Gordon, what's up? How are you? Good Welcome morning. To Good morning from beautiful San Diego, California. San Diego. Oh, my gosh, guys. We are recording at 9 a.m. Eastern time. And so you're up at 6 a.m. Are you a naturally early morning person? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm an early riser, so this worked out perfect for me. That's funny because I am an early riser as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm usually up sometimes as early as two thirty, three o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning. And I find that I get a lot of work done in that time. I can I can also use that time to meditate because it's so freaking quiet mm -hmm. that day. Um, it's just really good productive time. And then when when we're kind of about this time of day for me everybody's starting to wake up and it's starting to get busy and you kind of get lost in the shuffle of the busyness of, mm -hmm. the day, of the day. So yeah, I like that little early morning. Is that why you do it? Well, you no, know, I'm just a, a natural early riser, but to be honest with you, what happened, I work at a museum in Balboa park and we closed for the stay at home order. And I had only been there for 40 days. I had just started this job and I had been working at home longer than I was working there. Ah. And so I love getting up in the morning, pounding through my to-do list. Cause yeah. like you say, by the time everybody gets up and stirring, then they're disrupting my day, but I would have gotten. And so I I'm having a hard time with the concept of going back to work. Yeah. And you're not alone in that. There's a lot of people kind of dealing with that. They've gotten mm -hmm. comfortable. Uh, and I've worked from home for a very long time over mm -hmm. Now since I made this full time, but yeah, once you get a taste of that and you're like the freedom of like setting your own hours, mm -hmm. I try to push people Shelby so much to, if you can work for yourself and make it work where you can have your own flexible hours, do it because you'll be so much happier. Yeah. And my, you know, I'm a marketing person by trade, including 14 years in Anaheim at that place with the castle and the mouse. And so at this point in my career, I'm working on my terms, you yes, know, yes. so I, 
I teach as well, and that's what I always teach my students. I just want for you to build a career where you can work on your own terms. You're right. so much more creative, so much more productive, so much more collaborative. So, yeah, I'm having a hard time. Having well, a hard time. you will adapt, and from what I've seen of your work online, uh, you are an amazing woman. Guys, I want to show you on camera here, those of you watching this on the video, here is her Instagram page, so you can go follow her. Uh, and for those of you listening on the Live in La Vida Low Carb Show, it's fit.flexible.fluid over on Instagram. And you're a coach, uh, and you're a coach to, that does things not to specificity. And this is kind of the, the theme song I'm starting to see from a lot of people that used mm -hmm. to have shows and diet. You know I'm the keto guy, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. my heart is... I don't think everybody needs to do keto. I think mm -hmm. keto is appropriate in the right uh, circumstance. Uh, and you probably do too. Mm -hmm. People that they so obsess about their weight that they can't see the forest for the trees, that there's bigger issues at play than just your weight. Can you tell us why you kind of feel this, this whole diet mentality has led us down a very destructive path? Absolutely. Well, I think the only person who diets harder than I did walking upright on the face of the earth is Jimmy Moore. <laughs> During the height of my diet mania, I had a primary care physician, a bioidentical hormone physician. I had a body image therapist, a nutritionist, an acupuncturist, uh, a hypnotist and God, Jesus and them. I mean, I had a whole crew of, I, I had an army of people trying to get me smaller. And then I really started thinking about what was driving that. Yes. And all I really wanted, Jimmy, to be perfectly honest with you, was to feel good in my skin. Yes. That's all I wanted. I never envied other uh, black women, because that's who I particularly deal with. I never envied other black women, their size, shape, or weight. Right. I envied how they moved in their skin. Mm. And when I determined, or when it, it, when I evolved to the point of, I can't get, I'm not necessarily going to get more comfortable on my skin by being smaller. I needed to do some alternative kinds of work because I'm telling you, I, you and me were like inseparable. I, I was doing everything. And the only way I could actually get smaller was to stop eating. So I knew that that wasn't sustainable. And that's when I really had to ask myself, what's going on here? So that happened to me on my diet journey. But what happened to me on my advocacy, my advocacy journey was uh, several years ago, there was a paper published in Psychology Today um, entitled Why Black Women Are Not As Attractive As Other Women. Mm -hmm. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Wait, wait, wait. How did you react to that when you saw that title? What the? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have to praise Jesus in the process. We don't want to. What yeah. the? <laughs> and it was, uh, he was a blogger for Psychology Today, uh. taught at the London School of Economics. So, I mean, had some blue chip credentials. And this actually published in psychology today and I was that literally uh, stopped me in my tracks yeah and I said there is something else going on here there is some other um wave of information of thought of trope of stereotype of bias going on here so um I started you know, just digging around. I was still dieting at the time. 
So I'm started digging around and I'm going, wow. And then I think it's two years ago, um, two years ago, October, I stopped dieting. And I woke up one morning with my, um, my keto strip and my punch and my, and my body said to me, Shelby, we cannot do this anymore. And so that's when I really started looking around. I still wanted to be fit, right? I still wanted to be fit. I wanted to be able to, you know, um, do two laps at the golf course. I wanted to um, be able to walk Disneyland. I wanted to be able to, um, you know, go to the Chelsea Flower Show in London. And I, I wanted to still travel and do, I wanted to be fit. But that at that point for me didn't mean smaller um, and doing ev literally everything physically possible to try to shrink myself. So on this journey, I found healthy at every size, which made sense to me. And then um, I had a, an abundance of coaches, body joy, body, you know, P, body, body joy, body peace, body liberation. And some of it, uh, most of it was very good information, but I had been dieting too long to ever love my body. Mm. I had been dieting too long to ever find peace in my body. You're wow. a man of faith. You know how... Um, critical the word and the concept of peace is. I was never going to find that with my body. Um, and then I discovered body trust. And body trust resonated with me. What it was this? body trust is a concept developed by Dana and uh, Dana and Hillary at Be Nourished. And it really is about, you know, certainly it's, it's haze influenced, but it is looking at the multiple aspects of a body, emotional, physical, spiritual, um, and it has a very, very strong social justice uh, a layer to it. Mm -hmm. And body trust resonated with me. So I trust my body now. I trust my body to tell me, yes, girl, you can go another lap. Yes, girl, it's time to stop working. You've worked, you've put in a full day. Let's go get in the pool. Yes, girl, um, there's something not right with your medication. Let's reach out to Dr. Rebecca. Yes, girl, I don't feel good on this third day. That's, I mean, I'm trusting my body. And that was highly um, freeing, freeing. So um, that's really my coaching emphasis. Um, but the other thing I discovered was there wasn't a black coach who could coach me at my level. Wow. Right? They were still... Um, uh, they are still doing exceptional work in the body love, body peace realm. Right. But I had elevated above that and there was no black coach who could coach me at my level. So I said, OK, then that's the gap I'm going to fill. Why do you think that, Shelby, that there was no black coaches? Is it is there some kind of a stigma associated with it? N no, I think what what really is happening is black women um, don't necessarily give ourselves permission to take care of ourselves. So that's why um, we may be less likely to go to therapy and to get coaching mm. because we are giving out, pouring out so much you know, we have got careers, we've got husbands, we've got houses, we've got kids, we've got aging parents, we've got, you know, fur kids, we've got scaly kids, we're getting another degree, we are, we work at the church, we work at the community center, we're still volunteering, and there's very little left for us, and we haven't necessarily given ourselves permission to concentrate on ourselves.
Plus, there's probably frustration because whether we want to admit it or not, there are differences in our bodies that, yes, depending culturally on how you were raised and, yes. and the family, uh, like food eating values that you had, and, and the dynamic, the family dynamic, right? Yeah. My <laughs> chief weight, my chief weight stig stigmatizer is my mother. Ah, does she? So, I mean, there's that, and there's the church too. Yes. Oh, don't get so, me. Started. Yes. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of layers of stuff. So I decided, let me go down this route. And then um, as part of my coach training, well, actually, Rebecca, Rebecca Scritchfield is one of my coaches as well. Um, and she had Sabrina Strings on her podcast talking about fearing the black body. And um, that that is the book that I carry around with me. I got my Bible on my phone, but I carry Sabrina String's book with me. Um, so, because so people can hear it. Sabrina Strings, she wrote the book Fearing the Black Body. Fearing the Black Body. And this yes. is out to you because I had a friend that I know you're going to reach out to because she's a fellow H-A-E-S girl. Stephanie Dodier, shout out to you. Thank you for connecting me to Shelby. But she was the one that told me about that book. And I was like, wait, 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 what? Like fat stigma didn't start off from people just randomly being fat, being made fun of. Can you kind of tell the story? Absolutely. Um, it goes back hundreds of years, you know, thousands of years. And a, a great visual way to, to see it is how many portraits from great artists do you see of darker skinned people. And if you do see them, they are not the primary focus. They are in the background, maybe even serving. So um, it gets back to, to um, the discovery um, and the colonization of Africa and the, stig the stigmatizing and the lowering of the African people. And it gets back to all that bad race science and seen as savages and cannibals. And then you uh, bring these uh, darker skinned people to Europe and then you bring them to the Americas. And we see it in uh, France where there were three diseases. It was syphilis, it was tuberculosis, and then it was obesity that were blamed on black people. Whoa. Syphilis was blamed on black prostitutes in Paris. There were very few black prostitutes in Paris, but the outbreak of syphilis in Paris was blamed on black people. Um, tuberculosis was then blamed on black people and it was, uh, they categorized it as the domestic workers who were coming to work in white homes were bringing tuberculosis with them. And that was false, but it was blamed on black people. And then obesity is another one that um, it is centered on black folks and their weight, shape, and size. So those were three, you know, so this has a very long history. And then we get to America and we are going through different fashion and different, um, the evolution of the country. And then at one point, the church was saying to be heavy was a moral sin. And fatness was equated with immorality. And then it switched and uh, white women got too thin. And then they were concerned on whether they could bear children because, of course, the goal was to have this pure race. And then it spins again uh, and it spins again and again and again. And once we started seeing media become broader we started seeing these pictures of white women who were thin, they were corseted. So then you get into 
uh, proportions of waist versus hip. And of course, my waist hip ratio fluctuates like, you know, on any right. given day. Right. And and then we really get into the modern age where uh, white women are still held as the premier uh, face and form of beauty. And I think we saw that with the article, why are black women less attractive than other women? Mm. We see it in popular culture, correct? Um, I was reading the story, Beverly Johnson, who was the first black model on Vogue, no, Glamour, that was um, 1974. I was 10 years old. So before that, all I had ever seen was white women on every magazine cover, every television show, every billboard, every news, everything. Um, and then we have to switch with obesity, right? Overnight, the World Health Organization switched the the scale for obesity and overnight millions of people became obese because overnight they changed the scale. And all of a sudden we are in this obesity epidemic. And then I dare you to find a research study about black women that don't, that doesn't include in the first sentence the obesity epidemic has impacted Black women at a heavier rate. Right, right. Every single research study that you see starts with that sentence. Right, right. So the, the message of we're not pretty enough, we're not attractive enough, we're not worthy enough, we're not smart enough, uh, our voices should be silenced, our physical presence should be erased, our, we should diminish ourselves um, culturally, socially. We should diminish and reduce ourselves physically and in 3D. This message is constant. So I think what we're seeing now, um, particularly in the last hundred days, are some really interesting things. You'll know that for a portion through the pandemic, one of the issues was black people are getting COVID-19 more because of their weight. Right. right. That's what they said. And um, I had somebody ask me the other day, well, why are black people getting COVID-19 more? One, we're essential workers in many cases. Um, we're working in locations where we have exposure, higher exposure to COVID-19. Two, um, some of us go to the doctor less and we have less uh, quality relationships with our health care partners. We don't go. Why? Because we don't want to be fat shamed. Yeah, yeah that's right. And we will wait. You know, we may wait to go to the doctor too late. And by that time, it may be a full blown case. Wow. So there's multiple issues there, right? And then certainly the last four weeks since the death of George Floyd, we are seeing uh, in 3D live recorded on a television station or a, a smartphone near you, the value of black bodies. Uh, we saw public lynching. We saw pub. We saw public murder again the other night in Atlanta. You know, and these cases of black folks being killed, uh, and the the nonchalance of it um, that has now been erased. So now we're in a place where we can do a seismic shift. We are understanding, more of us are understanding now how Black bodies are feared, how, how Black bodies are um, sacrificed, and it's what are we going to do about it 
now. So we're seeing a lot of, let me take a look at myself. Let me do a lot of self check. In my work, my work, Jimmy, has shifted from individual coaching mm -hmm. to helping practitioners. So I'm getting, you know, eating disorder treatment folks, um, therapy, therapists, coaches, white coaches reaching out to me saying, Shelby, help us, help us um, better serve, help us um, enlighten us, um, give us the history, um, link us to Black practitioners and providers. And so that has been a silver lining out of this, I think. Um, I think white practitioners are going to be held to a higher standard and they are going to be asked to know more about the nuances of working with BIPOC communities. And that's specifically what I deal with. Now, in my dream of dreams, I would clone myself to deal with LGBTQ. Uh, but I need to stay in my lane and best service what, you know, and I'll find a clone at some point. <laughs> um, but that's what's happening in my work right now. Right. right. Can I, can I uh, because uh, I've been, I've been talking, talking about social injustice stuff in my own work. I've gotten a lot, a lot of it before. I cannot yeah. and what it's like to be a black person trying to talk about this your whole life. And I've only done it for a few weeks and I'm getting all these arrows. One of the pushbacks I've been getting is, okay, you're in the keto health space. Why are you talking about this? So can you make the argument why talking about this particular subject is health? Well, you can't talk about a weight and health, shape and exercise and um, emotional stability and mental stability without talking about the social piece of it. They are interconnected. And because weight and diet has been so white centric and so white centrically capitalistic, it folks are having a hard time understanding that this piece has always been there, but now it is pushing in the forefront. Uh, one, because the industries are demanding it, because there has been a lot of harm done. There has been a, a lot of harm done. Yes. I am still hearing of cases um, of Black or biracial clients who are pulled from treatment programs because the harm that has been caused to them in those situations has to be unraveled. Wow. And there's a frantic search for practitioners, one who can unravel the harm that's already been done to them and then help them get them back on track and through their course of treatment. So uh, they are totally interconnected. Um, we still hold white, cis, het, able-bodied men at the top of the pyramid, followed closely by white women. We've got all other um, ethnicities and cultures below them. And then we've got black women at the very bottom. So I think that ceiling is being busted. Um, when you, you talk about individuals like Lizzo, um, who really is a, 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 a public face, who is vocal. Um, She's a pop artist for those of you that know who, don't know who she is. Yeah, and I don't listen to her. I ha don't listen to her music. But she's so awesome. <laughs> but she, from a from a weight social justice perspective, she's a total star. So when you you get that, and when you get um, Aunt Jemima taken off of the 
the syrup and pancake. And when you get, you know, the CrossFit guy fired because he's like, I don't understand what all this social justice thing is. You know, he, he lost his job because he could not grasp the fact that George Floyd's death caused a seismic shift, shift on our globe. And he wanted to continue to ignore it. And his affiliates were saying, no, dude, we're out. So I think there are there's repercussions, there are clapbacks, there's breaking of business ties because of this, even in the fitness and weight industry. You know, Oprah sold quite a few of her shares in Weight Watchers the other day. So um, I, it it's totally interconnected and it will never again be disconnected. Yeah, and I and I sense that shift happening, and you're seeing things like Gone with the Wind, kind of right. being off HBO uh, Plus, and and various uh, Uncle Ben's White Rice, and yep. it's something that's been so subliminal, Shelby, that we just looked beyond it. And I'll tell you, as a white man in America, and I've got Mrs. Butterworth in my refrigerator right now, the sugar-free syrup. It's in there right now. I don't even. It was subliminal I, to you, Jimmy. Right. That's no. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That yeah. The person, it's become so, for lack of a better term, American. My world. What's American, that? Yeah. It's just become a part of it that I don't even see it as that way. But the subtleness of it is what you is what has hurt people like you, your whole life. And I'm wondering, how is it that this George Floyd just kind of lit the spark? the grenade explosives have been there forever. Why is it just now coming to light? I think it was a buildup. You know, we have seen, you know, we saw Trayvon Martin, then we saw Michael Brown, then we saw Eric Garner, who, by the way, in the court papers that Eric Garner's lawyers filed in the charges against the officer, the court papers literally said, well, he was obese and he would have died anyway. Mm. <laughs> no, dude, the fact that you held him in a chokehold, even as he's screaming, he can't breathe. That's why he died. But literally in the legal papers, they basically put, he was fat and he would have died anyway. Mm. So we see you know, black men being shot in the back, running away from police. We saw Breonna Taylor, who was minding her own business, who her mother was tremendously scared. She was an EMT. And in the COVID-19 crisis, her mother was concerned about her acquiring and dying from COVID-19. But she was shot eight times in her own house on a no-knock warrant in the middle of the night while the police were searching for a, a suspect that was already in custody, <laughs> all right? So then we see um, um, the young black jogger who was basically corralled and shot. And then we see George Floyd. So this is a buildup. Right. But the fact that those entire nine minutes were recorded right and then shown everywhere we may not have had proof of any of these other murders we may have we had an incident here in san diego on the in the little community next to mine a gentleman at a trolley stop was um really harassed by a policeman and the video camera was working but the audio wasn't so it's like, or the audio is working, but the video is not working, or they've turned off the video, the body cam, or this happens like Sandra Bland in a, in a jail cell overnight, you know, but that was eight minutes recorded from, from in total with in full technicolor. And I think that was the final proof and the final straw and for him to say the words i can't breathe 
for him to be calling out for his dead mother, for that officer to be standing on his neck with his hand in his pocket and his eye and his sunglasses on top of his head with the crowd saying, man, you're hurting him, man, he can't breathe. Um, I think that was the final straw. And and we're, we still, we've had five lynchings. We've had five hang, hangings. It may be even more now in the last week. So these deaths continue to happen and the unnecessary uh, brute force, uh, the over policing, um, I think that was the final straw. And I think that's why we saw protests all over the world. Britain also has a, a big racism pro problem, as does France. We are seeing huge, huge crowds in these places with George, the picture of George Floyd and his name. So I think it is going to change. It's changed a lot of perspectives forever. Um, other people, it has motivated us to protest. And we may take a sign, put on our mask and go protest. Um, and me, I protest online. Um, my mother, um, 82, went to George Floyd's high school in Houston. And the San Diego County governmental building was lit in their high school colors as a um, remembrance of George Floyd. So here my mother is in her little nice little sheltered world looking at cookbooks every day. But George Floyd's murder hit her in a special way because he grew up where she grew up. He went to school where she went to school and our city was recognizing that. Yeah. Yeah. Can I tell, Can you, I tell you, I'm disappointed in a lot of my white uh, and even Christian white friends because they don't seem to see the same world that you're describing here today. And it's unfortunate. And they want to make it about politics. They want to make it about, well, they're looting and they're rioting. And why are they doing that? I don't understand. And I just don't think that the white person understands the palpability of this issue in the black community to the point that you guys feel like you've been oppressed. You've been unheard. You haven't had your voice allowed to be put out there, which is why you're on the Whiter Than White Jimmy Moore's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I want to amplify voices like yours and let you express why you feel oppressed, why you felt unheard. So talk to those white people who don't think this is a thing and that, well, we're all, we're all in the human race. We're all together. Let's just get along. What do you mean civil rights happened? Slavery ended, da, 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 da. Talk to them about why you still feel like it's not an equal playing field today. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I come from a tremendous space of privilege. Um, my folks have been married for 66, for 56 years. Oh. My folks have been married for 56 years. And I have to tell them at least one time a day, get a room at least one time a day. La 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 la. <laughs> la la la. I know nothing. I hear nothing. <laughs> I see nothing. Um, you know, my parents were in my life every day. I went to a extremely a diverse high school. I had privilege. Um, I was a Head Start baby. Yes. Um, my mom got her bachelor's degree when I was five. So I went to San Diego State with her um, and I learned on campus with her. My wow. school was on the campus with her. So, Result. so yeah, so I had, you know, my mom's an educator, so education was important to me. Um, I was able to go to a four-year school um, right away. I was able to finish in four years, and I've had a really dynamic career. I work in tourism and hospitality, so I've worked at 
SeaWorld. I've worked at the Museum of Art. I worked at um, Disneyland for 14 years. I worked for a Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, I also worked for United Way, and I also worked for the Salvation Army. So I've had a wonderful, wonderful career. And my baptism and my Black girl magicness, Jimmy, only happened about three years ago when I really started getting into social justice and really started um, digging into the research and understanding because I was really coming from a place of privilege. Mm -hmm. And what I will tell you about white evangelical Christians is that they are religious. They are not Christian. If they were Christian, then they would understand, as Lisa Sharon Harper says, that Jesus was black skin and black, he was brown skin and black politic. Mm -hmm. Jesus was a brown man. And it wasn't until a pope decided that, that his brown skin should change did Jesus become a white man. And um, I was on a call the other day, we were doing a course called Decolonizing the Bible. And Lisa Sharon Harper was talking about how when she grew up, all her pictures of Jesus have been white and all the disciples have been white and their experiences have been white centric. And, you know, I grew up in the 70s and Jesus became black in the 70s. And, um, and she kept going on and on and he's white and he's white. And she was co-facilitating with a black South African um, doctor. And so Lisa Sharon Harper asked this woman, she goes, what do you think? And the woman said, I didn't care what color Jesus was as long as he was not for apartheid. <laughs> and that was like a huge bomb that went off in our head, in my head, right? But I still distinguish, and you will sometimes see me say there's a difference between being religious and being a Christian. Being a Christian is being a follower of Christ. Being religious is going through all the norms, the rituals, the spouting the philosophies, um, digging, doubling down on the history um, that is erroneous, but they're caught up in the pomp and circumstance. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we see, you know, white uh, pastors wanting people to come back to the physical church, even in the midst of the pandemic, because the church for them are the four walls. The church for them is where they can see and have control over that congregation, even for that period of time. Whereas I see the church changing forever. You know, I may never drive those four miles back to that sanctuary again. And I've had more church online since the pandemic than I probably have in the last four years, right? And I, I will go back there because I love the worship experience physically, but the church has changed forever. The church is, is virtual. It is personal. It is 24-7, um, not just on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Right. It is accessible from everywhere. So um, white evangelicals are still steeply entrenched in white supremacy, where Black folks and other people of color and um, non-binary, the other is still a second-class citizen. Um, who may not even be worthy of Jesus's love, forgiveness, and mercy. And they have um, been really successful in that whole mindset. It's worked for them for hundreds of years. So no, they don't want to change it now. They're afraid of losing power. They're afraid of losing prestige. They're definitely afraid of losing privilege. And they're afraid of losing control losing control. So I, um, I would say to them, check your privilege, reconnect with who Jesus was. 
reconnect with who Jesus really was and really is. Who he hung out with. Who and- he hung out with. What motivated him. Right. What actions he took. And where the miracles happened. So that's what I would say to them. Yeah, I think we've forgotten about the least and what that means. And not to get too spiritual on a low carb, <laughs> but, but just from, from the standpoint of my whole interest in this has not been out been about any kind of political statement, what Black Lives Matter the organization is doing, who's looting what city and for what reason, blah, blah, blah. To me, that's all noise. The main thing is identifying why do people feel oppressed? Why do a certain segment of people feel like they are less than other people? And to me, if you have a a humanity about you, if you have a heart about you, Christian or otherwise, I would think you'd want to get to the heart of that. Now, you said you grew up uh, in privilege, but I'm sure you had friends and you saw peers that were dealing with oppression being hurt. But you got to understand that in the eyes and the minds and the psyche and the history and the DNA and the pores and the cells of many of these white people, they either fear the black body, they want to erase the black body, they want to minimize the black body, and they they deem the black body unworthy. Can we unpack and, it? Because I, I think some people hearing this, Shelby will go, I, I don't do any of those things. Can you explain it a little more, kind of unravel it a bit for us? Absolutely. So uh, let's see. There's no right way to do this. Just go where you I'm trying to figure out where to start. Um, <laughs> They fear the black body. I think we see that certainly with the violence that we see against black men, black women, um, black trans. Um, we the the amount of death that's going on there is tremendous. When we look at the immigration, um, I call them corrals. Um, the 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 Latin folks that were trying to immigrate into the United States. We've basically got them in prisons down near my border, right? Hundreds of them. We have separated mothers and children. We have allowed them to not be cared for properly. We have put them literally in concentration camps, right? When you look at that, that is fearing, that is fearing a, a, an other that is fearing a group of people that um, because they can, because they can, right? Um, I worked, you know, for a corporate 100 company for many, many, many years. And while being really inclusive, because that inclus- inclusivity in that space equal creativity, creativity equaled. Um, innovation. Innovation equaled magic and magic equaled um, dollars. There were still circumstances where um, I had to take a white man to to meetings with me because (laughs) white people in these meetings chose not to understand what I was saying. So I had to have the white man interpret for me what I was saying. What, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Are, are you serious? Is that, did that really happen? Yeah, it happened. Like, okay, okay, I, I, I'm dying now. Tell me an example of something okay. said that had to be translated through a white man. Okay, so uh, an example, I would meet with these certain partners and my boss at the time was a white man. Uh, one of the best bosses I ever had, but I took him to every meeting that I had with him, every single meeting, because I would say something, I would make a recommendation or make an analysis or summarize something. And this white partner would look at me 
And then I would look at my boss and he would say it <laughs> exactly what I said. Do you, do you feel that? Was it being racist? Like, what's happening? There, it was racist. It was clueless. But look, I had stuff to do. And I figured out a way to get my voice heard. Right. Even though it was coming through somebody else's mouth. And then the other thing that would happen is I would say something, make a recommendation, make an analysis, make a summary. And they would look at me. And then they would repeat it as their own thought. <laughs> do you think as they realize what thought. show? Do you think they even realized what they were doing or had it become so much a part of who they are because of that black woman at the bottom of the totem pole you right. think, uh, earlier yeah. that it became subconscious racism? Yeah, yeah, it did. But then I would have other instances. For example, when I first got to Disney, um I was hired and a black woman was promoted. I was brought in and a black woman was promoted on the same team by the same manager at the same time. And there was a white gentleman there who um, I worked with. He never would have hired me and he never would have promoted her. Right. 10 years later, I was working uh, on the marketing team, supporting his sales efforts. And he came to understand about me that I loved Mickey and Minnie, that I loved the castle, that I was a student of Walt Disney, and that the, that the core of the storytelling discipline was alive in me. And we worked together for several years. He was getting ready to retire. And he told my boss, he goes, don't reassign Shelby until after I retire. And I worked on a project. And he walked in my office, shaking this project in my face, going, this is the most beautiful brochure I've ever seen in my life. That's 10 years. Wow. Right? And the day he retired, he would not leave until he saw me. Wow. And was able to hug me and was able to say, thank you, you're an awesome cast member. Wow. So I, I saw evolution there. Um, some of it will never be changed. Um, um, but I found a way to maneuver around it and found a way to thrive and excel in that environment. And this is the challenge that I think a lot of white people don't understand. Because I have white skin, I'm automatically given somewhat of the benefit of the doubt about things when it comes to almost every aspect of life. Uh, I'm the most hated man in America right now, being a white yeah. guy. <laughs> but... Not necessarily. Well, not, yeah. not, but you know, we just need for you to open your eyes. Right. We just need for oh. white men to open the app. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I'm trying to, and it's why you're on the show today. And thank you, by the way, this has been intense. Absolutely. But, um, I think recognizing that we need to have Martin Luther King Jr.'s philosophy of let's don't judge people by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character and an extension of that story you just said by your worth in this world. I mean, here it is, he had very subtle racism that he was showing towards you at the beginning, but by the end, he could yeah. come to you and hug yeah. you. How do we get America, the world, and this whole issue to go through that evolution in real time? I know it's gonna happen on an individual basis and people may be listening today or having their ears open and their eyes opened to try to be better individually, but how do we collectively get there? Well, I think we are, we're taking quantum leaps, Jimmy. Okay. We are taking, look at what has happened in the last two weeks. We have the NFL saying we were wrong in the way that we were right. dealing with our players. We should have listened more to our players. Right. We, we see... Um, 
another wave of firings and um, real corporate admonishment from people who are um, insensitive, racist, demeaning, hurtful, and harass. We're we've seen we're seeing a wave of that. We're seeing um, brands and advertising brands shift and change. Um, we have seen a lot of feedback and dialogue um, with corporations and organizations who posted anti-racial messages after the George Floyd killing, but who are then being called on the carpet and will be held accountable for what they are doing as a result of that. Right. So I, it's not, it's not all going to be erased in a, in a, in a broad sweep, but we are taking quantum leaps forward, quantum leaps forward. I think there are, what, what is happening to me is people are reaching out to me saying, Shelby, teach me, Shelby, show me. And oh, by the way, I'll pay you. Wow. So I think the, the, I think the message of um, if I'm if my flag is up and I'm opening for business to do anti-racism work, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do it for free. Right. If my banner is down and I'm not doing racism work because I'm trying to heal the wounds that I'm feeling every day, please respect that. And I'll see you on the other side. Right. So I see. Uh, folks reaching out a lot more. I see there's going to be a lot of dialogue. Look at the books on the top of the New York seller non fiction. Number one bestseller last week was White Fragility, which, by the way, I bought it in the Kindle and the audiobook where it reads along as you. And Don't read that one. What's that? Don't read that one. Don't read that one. Read. Um, I'm getting to several. Me and white supremacy is another one. That's a good one. And um, how to not be a racist. Right. Read that one first. Okay. Read that one first. Read I, that one before you read white fragility. And if you need, if you need a launching point right. into this, white fragility may work for you. But if you want to go right to the heart of it, right, then read black authors. Well, and the thank you, by the way, I was going to make the point that I think because White Fragility was written by a white woman, that might be an entry point for a lot of white people to go, well, I just don't want to hear directly from a black person because, of course, they're going right. to be, here's a right. white person. So for that reason, right. good starting point. But you're right. For those of us that have kind of gotten into this, let's get deeper. There's yeah. so really good ones. And I'm starting to follow a lot of them on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, including yourself, by the way. Thank uh, you. Try to learn more. And I, I think the worst thing that can happen, Shelby, as we conclude this, the worst thing that can happen is this burns white hot right now for a few weeks, few months, maybe even through the end of 2020. And then it's gone. And so how do we prevent that? Well, one, I think that that race and race um, relations are going to be a huge part of the presidential election. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's going to be the case. And so as we, we go through these, you know, final months of the election, up to the election, post-election, I think it's going to be huge. Um, I think the learning is going to continue. And unfortunately, there are going to be more deaths. There are going to be more that we've got to figure out why these six men hung themselves. Right. We've got to figure that out. How does that make you feel to think that there's going to be more deaths? I mean, you've been hurting on the inside since yeah. Trayvon and all the others. Yeah, yeah. Continuation of it, like that has to wear on you psychologically. Like, what, yeah. what, you stop the bleeding. There is there a bandage big enough to put on this? Yeah, and it it's gonna it's gonna be I think at the local level. So you know I always say you know vote for your dog catcher the same way you do your president. Um, you know there was a a sheriff I think was in Texas who 
made a statement um, that the reason why black people are um, protesting right now is because they were so well taken care of during slavery. Oh, <laughs> oh, God. he literally said that. Literally I, said that it was I, in the newspaper. We're sorry because that's stupid. Yes. That so. I mean, you need to vote at your local level. You need to right. vote for school board, for district attorney, for right. council people, for county supervisors, for judges. Um, you can make it change at the local level. Man, there's certainly no easy answers to this, but I yeah. think having what we did here today, Shelby, and that's dialogue and talking yeah. about things, I want to continue to amplify voices just like yours, and you are mm -hmm. a sweetheart of a woman, so thank you. My for, pleasure. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. All the work that you're doing, not just helping people uh, understand that it's not all about their weight, uh, and we could have gotten into a whole deep oh, discussion yeah. just about that topic, but uh, we kind of veered into what's probably the most important thing to mm -hmm. talk about. Mm -hmm. but, man, thank you so much for all you're doing in the space of social justice health at every size, all the things that you're doing and keep up the great work. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm Jimmy Powered. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to steal that. Yeah. I'll be <laughs> Jimmy Powered. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do you have a website or anything or just that Instagram page? Um, I am changing the website because the focus of my coaching is changing, but okay. they can find me on Instagram. I'm there. i I blast posts usually in the afternoon. Yes. I and noticed. since I'm up early in the morning, I usually blast in the morning because I actually have a day job that I need to go do. Yes, thank you. Fit.flexible.fluid. And you can email me at Shelby at fitflexiblefluid.com. Excellent. So fit.flexible.fluid over on Instagram. And what a joy you are. Thank you so thank much you. for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. All right.